I want to start just by introducing the, for those of you that don't know the San Francisco Estuary Institute, in a few words, we try to deliver science for people and nature. We're both a non-advocacy environmental research institute and a nonprofit environmental consulting firm. Our primary clients are land use and natural resource managers from local to federal level and a few business leaders like Google. For about 27 years, our 75 scientists and technical experts provided have provided independent objective science on issues from water quality to climate adaptation to designing GIS tools and other technology. These tools are intended to empower local leaders to monitor, assess, and visualize solutions to complex uh, landscape scale problems. Next. I wanna first acknowledge that we have the pleasure at SFEI of both learning and working uh, with many of you that are on this uh, meeting today. Uh, people that the John Coleman and Bay Planning team have assembled. You are really the experts, you're the creators, you're policy wonks, you're public servants, and you're change makers. And you've largely determined that you will largely determine the ecological future of this region. I thank you all for what you've done. More importantly, for what we collectively must do damn quickly if we're going to face our grandchildren and be able to say with pride rather than embarrassment, this is the world we're passing on to you. Next. I believe that the staff at SFEI and most of you in this meeting uh, can easily share what I think is an important common goal. And that is that the Bay Area can and should become a national model, if not an international model, of how a region of almost 8 million people living at the edge of the sea can adapt to the immense challenge of climate change and do so, I hope, with great vision, hope, and creativity. Next slide. Obviously, it's called the Bay Area for a reason. The Bay defines a great many of our communities. We exist as part of a really large and very amazing ecosystem. We also live, frankly, in a virtual bathtub fed by the largest estuary on the west coast of North America. And the water in this tub, this bay, this estuarine ecosystem is constantly rising. Next slide. If there's one single idea that should guide our adaptation efforts over the next couple of decades, it's this. We're interdependent. Whatever we do in any portion, especially any shoreline segment of this system, will directly impact and affect our neighbors and the rest of the system. Next. And compared to the rest of the planet, which in many cases seems to be going crazy, let's not forget that we do live in a virtual paradise, sort of the, the bubble of the Bay Area. Here's one true amazing fact that I learned when I joined SFEI. 500 years ago, when Columbus stumbled on a Caribbean island, the greater Bay Delta region was, the most, was among the most densely populated areas of human habitation in the entire Western Hemisphere. Why? Temperate climate, unimaginable ecological abundance. Next slide. This map shows the communities that existed in the Bay Area pre-Columbus uh, landing. You can see that those who lived here before us on whose ancestral lands we now live included the Ohlone, the Coast Miwok, the Bay of Miwok, and the Patwin tribal communities. They all knew this truth. They lived a cultural lifestyle that maintained and enhanced the biological diversity, uh, so much so that when the Spaniards first came across the Bay Area, they commented and wrote about its park-like qualities. Today, those tribal uh, communities are considered extinct. Their descendants are, are not even yet recognized by the federal government as, as tribes. Next. Fast forward to today. The Bay Area is the global headquarters of Google, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, almost every major tech and communications company that's transform transformed how most of the planet accesses knowledge, communicates, works, and plays. Why here? Yes, of course, it's because some of the founders got their start here, but it's also the quality of life in this region, access to an amazingly rich and diverse natural environment. That's a major factor that attracts and makes people want to live here and stay here and work with these companies and why these companies have stayed here and haven't moved elsewhere, despite the amazingly high cost of living. Next. Yet, despite our ecological riches, 
we're all on the global climate change roller coaster. And the daily news drumbeat of news says it's happening faster and faster and it's getting worse and worse. And we're sleepwalking still through our response. While narrow, while we have a very really narrow window to avoid a global catastrophe that has almost slammed the window shut on our fingers. Next. For the Bay Area, you know, we're seeing the impacts of drought, occasional flooding, and the horror of nearby wildfires. For those of us living in this one bathtub, the unique, a unique impact is the triple whammy of sea level rise, rising groundwater, and lowland flooding from more intense storms. Next. We've already mapped the areas at risk from sea level rise and flood risk. We're scrambling and we're behind the curve on mapping the unanticipated huge impact of rising groundwater. Basically the rising groundwater issue is that as the seas rise, they put pressure on the many, many areas around the Bay Area where we have very shallow groundwater tables and that groundwater is gonna push up um, into the basements and um, in other, other, other infrastructure areas. Um, uh, the area is com the situation is compounded by the fact that many of these areas that have are subject to rising groundwater are recently are very lowland areas. There were, used to be industrial, so they're highly often many of them are highly polluted. And guess what? That also happens to be where our most disadvantaged, underserved communities now exist. So next. Our entire urban infrastructure, our ports, our airports, our highways, our water treatment plants, as well as most of our vulnerable underserved communities lie in this path of this triple threat. Next. The US Geological Service tells us that California's entire $150 billion of coastal assets are at risk from sea, of, of the $150 billion of coastal assets that are at risk from sea level rise and storm surges, two thirds or $100 billion worth are here in the Bay Area. Now I wanna sort of make a personal observation and a prediction. The observation is this, back in the early 70s when dinosaurs roamed the earth and men's fashion was at its lowest point in recorded human history, I was on a campaign team that passed the coastal initiative. Since then I've observed that the coastal zone be at the outer coast of California, or the San Francisco Bay Area is literally the Beirut Benghazi Baghdad of land use politics. There's a literal mountain of laws, agencies, lawyers, public interest groups that work in this zone. As such, land use decisions in this area move very slowly. I suggest that the Bay Area's ultimate challenge is to make the political and policy Aikido move to reverse this glacially slow decision-making trend and to dramatically accelerate the bold decisions that we're going to have to make with to work with nature to protect this zone. Next. My prediction is the Bay Area is lucky to have 10,000 engineers and about 10,000 scientists to help work on these issues. We're going to need them, every one of them. However, the two real frontier areas I suggest where innovation and transformation is really needed is in the areas of governance and finance. With governance, how are we gonna get our 101 cities, our nine counties and multiple region, regional agencies to work with state and federal agencies to move faster and more collaborative on the regional solutions for what are essentially large scale, landscape scale, regional environmental threats. And to determine where are we gonna find the probable $100 billion that is likely gonna require to rebuild our entire infrastructure to survive to the, to the next century. Next. Now, yet, yet be, I, would, I want to compliment, again, the people that are on this Zoom call, because, because of your vision and your leadership, you, you know, we have a foundation of hope in this bubble of sanity in the Bay Area. In 1999, some of you helped write the Bayland Goals Report. That established a target to work with nature to protect and restore about 100,000 acres of Bayshore wetlands, both for their ecological value and uh, for the, and the fact that they provide the most cost-effective and nature-based solutions to buffer our shore from sea level rise. In about 2015, a coalition of about 21 management agencies led by the Coastal Conservancy with science support from SFEI updated that 1999 Bayland Goals report. The basic conclusion of the 
2015 update was to use, well, I'll, I'll call it a highly scientific term, which was, holy moly, we've got to move a lot faster. Um, that report then laid the groundwork for the 2016 spectacularly successful uh, measure double A tax measure that's going to raise $500 million for Bay Wetlands restoration. That passed by over 70% vote across nine counties. And as someone who's worked on political campaigns, I tell you, 70% is off the charts. It's, it's, it's Putin scale uh, elections. It's not, it, it rarely ever occurs in democratic societies. This may have been the nation's first regional tax measure that specifically focused on climate change adaptation. So score one for the Bay Area sanity and our national climate leadership there. Next. That in turn led to a burst of local and regional adaptation planning. This graphic of almost three years ago shows just some of the areas where pro local projects are going on. If this graph were updated as of today, the number of dots would probably be, be four or five times as much. Next. Another big, I think, advance was funded by the Regional Water Board. Nonprofit folks stepped up. SFEI partnered with SPUR and collaborated, collaborated with local and regional planners to produce the Shoreline Adaptation Atlas. We recognize that about 90% of climate adaptation is land use planning, and about 90% of land use planning is still done under the authority of cities and counties. So we wanted to provide sort of as much environmental regional environmental information in one format to empower those local officials to work across multiple jurisdictions to solve the land use issues within their jurisdictions, but recognizing that the impacts and the issues are regional in, in scope. Next. We divided the San Francisco Bay region into 30 what we called operational landscape units following a, a sort of a Dutch planning concept. Next. We compiled and mapped as many factors as possible. The Atlas probably has about 50 maps that provide more information than you would ever want to know about both ecological and land use issues across the Bay Area. Next. And for, for each of these 30 um, OLUs, we created sort of an options map. It's not a blueprint. It's not a suggestion of you know, what you should do, but it's a suggestion of options that should be considered to how to work with nature and, and solve shoreline problems. Next. Last year, SFAI also released the Sediments for Survival Report. In this report, we wanted to quantify how much sediment is going to be needed to supplement the natural supply to maintain our bay wetlands and to avoid having them drown as sea level rise. Next. A fun but maybe disturbing fact is that the amount of additional supplemental sediment we're going to need is about 450 million cubic yards. Just to visualize that, this, this offers one option. Salesforce Tower, if you filled Salesforce Tower with mud, it would be 1 million cubic yards. We're going to need the equivalent of 450 Salesforce Towers to be laid end to end and located in our wetlands, the equivalent in sediment, if we're going to make sure that our wetlands rise over the next 80 years to keep pace with sea level rise. Next. Also last December, we made another big advance. Both the MTC ABAG and BCDC produce, produced their two critical regional adaptation strategies, respectively uh, the Bay Area 2050 report from MTC ABAG and the Bay ADAPT report from BCDC. Next. Funding, lots of it. Last year, the state and federal government passed major bills to fund climate resilience and infrastructure upgrades. I think the governor's budget last year had about 3.7 billion for climate adaptation, for climate resiliency. If you just consider the fact that California is one fifth of the state's population. So if we've got one fifth of that amount for resiliency, we should be getting somewhere in the range of 500 to $800 million from the state government for climate resilience specifically for climate resilience projects. And there's additional funds that are in the state budget for drought, wildfire, transportation uh, related issues. If you take the fact that um, the federal government's 1.2 trillion climate or 1.2 trillion um, infrastructure bill, California's 10% of the US population. So California should be getting about 120 billion of that money. One fifth of the 
population, uh, it means that California, or the Bay Area should be getting, you know, quite a few billion dollars there. Um, we'll see whether that actually plays out next. So today, I think the Bay Area kind of faces a really major fork in the road. We've got two options. Option one is for our regions, 101 cities, nine counties, and multiple regional agencies to compete for those funds. For this option, I'm reminded of a final scene in the classical American historical documentary, Blazing Saddles. Next. I suggest that the, that, that option, if we follow it, is gonna result in a chaotic, divisive, unproductive food fight. Here's my best illustration of that food fight with the regional agencies and top hats and tuxedos and the lowly cities, counties, and CBOs uh, being the, the, the motley crew that's fighting over the funds. That's not an avenue that I think is going to be very successful. Next. I suggest that we seriously consider option number two. I suggest that our regional agencies work overtime to convene and consult with the region's 101 cities, nine counties, especially the leaders in planning and public works departments um, and flood management agencies who are on the front lines of climate adaptation, as well as the community-based or organizations that represent um, you know, the many communities that are gonna need to be in, involved in this proposals in, 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 in funding solutions that are both local and regional. Instead of maybe 120 proposals being submitted to state agencies, what would happen if we actually sat down over the next few months and really worked hard and came up with five or six proposals? Let's not forget that the regional agencies that are handing out this money have a limited amount of staff. And if we do the heavy lifting and the hard work and the political challenges of trying to work out our issues, I think they're going to be much appreciative of us, the Bay Area, maybe submitting five or six or seven or even 10 proposals for funding versus uh, 100, 110 proposals. You know, one bold idea that uh, Jessica Fain, uh, the senior plan, the planning director at uh, BCDC came up with, she put a straw man, straw person proposal out that, that said, let's ask for 130 billion or 130, sorry, 130 million, you know, right up front as one large strategic overarching grant, just to get the ball rolling, to build that dynamic trust and relationship between the cities, the counties, the regional agencies and, and, the, and the CBOs. I think that's a great idea that we ought to be exploring and, and considering further. I'd also note that the Bay Area has a variety of sort of informal networks. So there's BayCan, which is a collaboration of about 40 entities, mostly planning officials from local governments that have been working specifically to network and coordinate across the region. There's CHARGE, a collaboration that's comprised of the cities and counties, flood managers and public works directors. Those two entities should be heavily involved and engaged in working with the cities, the counties and the regional agencies to develop a region-wide strategy. I'd suggest also that two good examples of community-based efforts are in the Resilience by Design contest uh, back in 2017 and 18. Marin City had a project that they called it the People's Plan and the local coordinators worked to put the local community leaders through a, a several month training program in learning about ecological issues and planning and the community brought their local knowledge to produce a, a, read, a strategy specifically for that community that was, I think, brilliant and, and very far reaching. Secondly, the Bay Restoration Authority recently funded um, the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project to produce a uh, about a three month training program that was called the Alameda Shoreline Leadership Academy. Again, a process that took about 18 local leaders, put them through a training process, um, tr paid them for their time to do that training and to produce specific projects. They're looking now for funding for phase two of, of that effort to actually implement those projects. Those are just two good examples of the type of community-based bottoms up solutions that we are capable of doing in the Bay Area. Next slide. Um, well, this, this was just a, 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 I got behind on my slides, I didn't do next. This was just some images from the uh, people's planning process in, in Marin City. Next slide. I further suggest that our local and regional state leaders work to try to streamline the permitting process. Uh, the old wisdom is that enviros would 
grab their pearls and clutch their throats and say, oh my God, you know, we, we can't, you know, streamlining is, is a horrible word. Well, if we're going to actually move forward and deal with shoreline issues, we're going to have to find a way of kind of building on the, the BRIT process that was established to try to speed up um, the wetlands development projects on a project by project basis, we need to be trying to apply that streamlining effort across the entire region. Uh, SFEI and, and the Public Policy Institute did a study and a, and a report that was produced about six months ago that offered specific ways to do that, that streamlining. Next slide. I think if we do these things, I believe we can become the international model for multi-jurisdiction and multi-agency collaboration. Next slide. I think the results will empower cities and counties on the front line of climate adaptation. It's gonna empower community groups. It's gonna build the necessary and central trust between the local and regional leaders that's gonna be needed to solve regional landscape scale issues. Next. I think we can create shoreline areas that provide multiple benefits of increased recreation, increased wildlife habitat, as well as cost-effective shoreline protection from sea level rise. Next. As we become more urban, we'll give our grandchildren a more sustainable and ecological future. Next. I'm not suggesting that we all pray at the temple of nature-based solutions. There are dearly, you know, there are clearly places where gray infrastructure, tide gates, pumps are needed, but for the vast portions of the bay, especially in the far north and the far south, these nature-based solutions have an enormous role to play and are the most cost-effective solution going forward. 